here. I wanted to thank everyone for coming this afternoon. Uh, yesterday we had three sessions with stakeholders and Dan has been working tirelessly with staff pretty much through the night, I'm going to have to say, uh, to bring this presentation to you today. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to let Dan get started. And then at the end, if you have comments or questions, that's why the mic's here. So thank you very much. And Dan, off to you. Great. Thanks, Michelle. And good afternoon, Mount Pleasant. All right. <laughs> it's great to be back. And um, what I'd like to do is put the presentation in two parts. The first part, I'll basically uh, give you my background piece, uh, build the case for using different tools, and then uh, define what uh, will work well as, as a quarter solution, be very affordable, and so on. Um, but then get you very excited to raise the bar height as high as it can be raised so that people talk about your town for a long time to come and come here to see how to do things right. Uh, following that, then get your input. Uh, which things you saw did you like? Uh, which things uh, we need a little fine tuning? Uh, what things did we forget? And with that, let me start by first asking uh, anyone here for the first time today wasn't part of the walk or the interviews? Okay, a couple people? Okay. Uh, it's okay, you're with good people. These are good people. Uh, and we've got more people coming in all the time. Okay, so I'll go right into the presentation. And uh, then at the conclusion, we're going to look for your input. And I want to start with the whole notion that we really need to dream big. We're run out of the ability to pull things off if things aren't truly exciting. And so uh, I want to put that magic in the presentation, but certainly in the recommendations. And for many reasons. First of all, we've run out of uh, room and money. We can no longer keep building our cities for our cars. It never has worked, but all that system is coming to a halt. It can't keep growing. And if we're going to have cities that work, that are affordable, that we're in love with, then we have to design them for people first. And it's that simple. And uh, so when we look at Main Street as a corridor, we begin to realize that we've only used half the street. That over time, uh, we've allowed speeds to be too high, too exotic, and we really don't have a, a, an effective town gown connector. And we need all these things in order for uh, both the downtown to work and for the campus to work the way we would like it to with less auto dependency. And so what we can see evolve over time is something that is even more green than it is today, feels more narrow, because it is, and starts to support all the things we really uh, care about. Now, I'll introduce very quickly some new vocabulary. A mini circle is one of the most inexpensive ways we can alter the speed of traffic and create safety. Indeed, mini circles in Seattle now one thousand on the ground have brought down crashes in neighborhoods 93 percent and they've increased neighborhood pride dramatically we can inset parking using curb extensions obviously the trees you, which you are very fortunate to already have very well grown uh, can still use some additional uh, infill and so on our whole approach is to listen to what the neighbors and other uh, investors in the community have been thinking for years before we even start to design. And uh, for many reasons, uh, in a few hours I'll be gone. You won't see me until there's another project. Uh, it will be your dream, it'll be your street, and you'll drive it every day. So it's got to work for you, not for me. I can be very flexible. Well, the really good news is Mount Pleasant is just made up of all kinds of pleasant people that keep giving to their town. Yeah, these are good people. And uh, they um, uh, really do form a core of people who are willing to go out in the cold and brave hardship and, and uh, take a walk or come to a meeting, which is uh, typically thought of as just something that, okay, it could be pretty boring to go to a meeting, 
but not when these people fill the room. Uh, so it was really cool yesterday to gain all of your input, be able to record it, and now be able to share your ideas. And likewise, any town is always built on its previous successes. Mount Pleasant has uh, been doing many beautiful things, including your most recent roundabout, uh, very well designed, nicely articulated, and a bold statement about being able to embrace the future. Now, also, before we get into design, it's important to understand uh, the context. Uh, with a great university that will continue to grow and prosper, that is already redoing its master plan, that uh, is looking for a way to connect better with the community and with the very precious students who come here to be schooled, many of whom decide to stay, uh, to figure out how to get a job or set up a business of their own. Uh, we have a corridor of beautiful proportions, not only by the, the right bones of the street layout and grid, but with the beautiful uh, homes, some of them being very well kept up, some not as well, uh, with the context of having that connection to the downtown, but not anything dramatic. And then many, many uh, blocks of street that, uh, again, most of the time have no use uh, other than high-speed traffic. And uh, we've been getting messages for a long time that we've been going the wrong way with this street. Indeed, we can go out on the street right now and the signs say it's wrong. Am I right about that, folks? Yeah. So we pay attention to the signs. And uh, we uh, take models and examples from other streets, uh, university in this case, and uh, observe the use of the street for people trying to use it as a corridor for, for walking, cycling, uh, but recognize that there are issues with parking. And uh, meanwhile, we don't see a lot of parking on Main Street itself. And knowing that we have a resource that we're not taking full advantage of. And then re recognizing that a lot of the off-street parking, some of which may meet code, others that has nothing to do with code, and certainly not with taste. And to figure out how can we make uh, so much more of these beautiful lawns and yards in a way that makes sense. So let me introduce a little more on the tools themselves, starting with the mini circle. It uh, is a basic concept in traffic engineering that if people can't keep going straight, then they'll have to slow down. And uh, we can use them in different locations, and uh, we can green them up. But one of their most powerful and endearing features is they look like a garden. It actually looks like the street ends. And as people see that, they start to slow down 500, and some folks even 1,000 feet away from the intersection. And since your blocks are less than 1,000 feet, that means they never really speed up when they see a mini circle. We can also. Uh, make them unique, distinct to each location. Uh, they can be rural in character. They can have gardens uh, that are taken on with ownership by sororities, fraternities, the campus itself, others. So we have a great source of uniqueness and pride with each intersection, no redundancy. And again, uh, they're a very powerful engine. They are very low priced and they continue to pay dividends forever. Now, at either end, perhaps, the mini circles need to be very pronounced. They need to be a statement of arrival uh, to draw us, as any great uh, terminating vista would, uh, to a location that gives us greater joy of walking to downtown or wherever. We can also use curb extensions. Um, and then, again, uh, using the creative uh, talents of the people here, unique tiles, unique plantings, whatever, uh, and give people creative license to come up with something that's very attractive and functional, as we see here. Now, I can imagine this being somewhere, but if it is, say, near the campus, it will probably be overflowing with bubbles all the time or other things. Uh, but I just want to show you what other people have done. Uh, and for example, in 
London, some of their mini circles are actually flat. And they still get snow, and they still deal with the snow with their flat mini circles. And they're very effective, even though they're flat, but they're, there's no chance for a garden here. In another case, where we uh, didn't have enough right away to build a true roundabout, we were able to build a mini circle that totally controls the intersection and can be an emblem, such as a, a campus uh, design, uh, something that uh, makes it so clear that you've arrived, this is the entry to the campus or the downtown, whatever. And uh, also makes it easy for emergency responders to go across what we call the short side rather than around when they're coming in code three. To see how one might actually physically fit, uh, this one you can see placed here in a project we worked on, uh, the amount of land it takes up. And uh, notice it keeps the driveway completely open. We can add some additional features uh, to further control the yielding behavior and uh, gain the slowing. And then, again, to illustrate, when a large vehicle like a garbage truck, a semi-tractor trailer, a float for a parade, or whatever, it can go across the short side. That's totally permitted. But a normal driver wouldn't do that. Uh, it wouldn't make sense. The next tool would be to um, bring out the palette and come up with a creative uh, way to colorize an intersection. We note that motors will drive a much slower through an attractive intersection uh, than they will through one that just is loaded up with asphalt. So that's a, another tool in addition to a mini circle. This one in um, Seattle, Washington. Next tool, bike lanes. Uh, many of you asked for uh, special places for bikes to, to operate and not on the sidewalk, which uh, I totally agree with. And, uh, so bike lanes are a very basic now, standard uh, design, uh, typically to the right side of the road. And uh, they can be colorized. Another thought or idea here in Paris, very soon in Minneapolis, already in Washington, D.C., uh, they now have bike rentals. So students could be given extra funds on their, what, what do you call it, Matric matriculation fee, or that word I've never learned how to pronounce? Well, thank you. <laughs> and, and so they, they get so much they can either put into parking or they can put into what other, other benefits. But one of the things they can get is on their credit card, it gives them so many dollars a year to ride a bike anytime they just want to grab it when they get to downtown, they lock it back up, and it stops the meter. So you could ride many months with such a system, if in place. Bike lanes have problems. If you don't make them wide enough, you could get doored, which is a very, very sad thing to have happen to you. And so we want to make sure if we design them, that we design them with adequate width. And then, when we get the street speed so low that the bicyclists and the motors are traveling almost the same speed, uh, we really w don't want to do anything. Putting people in a bike lane when the speeds get low is actually a hindrance to their progression. So I just wanted to give you a range. The next set of tools is to use parking to slow down traffic speed and to get the front lawns back open again for, for uh, what they should be used for, which is uh, beauty. Uh, we can do parking that uses tree wells, and this is going to become really important when we talk about getting some added width, that we can preserve and protect all the trees and have more parking. And there are different ways we can do that. We can also make it very green to where all this uh, uh, water, snow, whatever, uh, actually penetrates the block structure and is, is treated uh, appropriately. Uh, these, again, are, are just examples of streets that uh, had the classic planter row, and they needed the parking. The parking was very important for a number of reasons. So they just basically sheltered and protected the tree, kept the brick structure open and porous so the trees get all the oxygen and, and uh, nutrition that they did before. Back in angled parking is a powerful new tool. It's actually the best way anyone can park a car. And to give you a little bit of description, uh, when you go to pull out, you have a total commanding view 
of the road. You can see the bicyclist. Back in angle parking only takes up uh, a fraction, well not a fraction, but a portion of the space of front end angled. Simply because the back end of a car overhangs a little more and you don't need all that discovery distance in the travel lane so it actually consumes less part of the total right of way. And, uh, and it's the easiest way to park. Uh, aside from uh, not driving at all and parking a bike. Uh, if we use bike lanes with it, uh, again, there's, with the valley gutter and then the bike lane, uh, there's a very, very adequate view by the bicyclists before they would uh, see a motorist and be able to both correct for one of those behavior. Now, one possibility with the back in angle parking is to create a chicane. So say one block, the first half of the block you have the angle parking on the west side. Once you get to the mid block you put in a chicane, two islands, and then you switch the parking to the other side. So there's a natural slowing effect and calming effect by doing something like this. And um, very popular, very successful, and truly a very good calming agent uh, can be used uh, obviously on almost any street that has moderate uh, traffic volumes. These are all found in Seattle. We can even do back in angle parking on principal roadways. This is uh, the main road uh, in University Place. It carries about 23,000 cars a day and uh, they are now going to back in angle parking. Uh, I'll be able to go back and photograph it when it's fully open. You would never do front end angled parking on a street with this volume, but back end angle we can get away with, uh, along with the bike lanes. Bicycle parking. Uh, it should be fun. It shouldn't just be a way to tie up to a tree. It should be attractive. You can use the campus uh, symbol, language, vocabulary. Uh, it helps organize, orchestrate parking. Uh, where you place it matters. Notice this is right in front of windows uh, so they feel comfortable putting a bike pump here with, locked up but still it's a bike pump with the parking. Uh, in Homer, Alaska, another seaside town. Now this is the big recommendation of the day is to come up with a way that we can provide for bikes without having to eat up any additional space at all. It's a brand new concept. It's only been tried in two cities, but it's, it's getting outstanding reviews. And the ones I'm gonna show you were taken in Long Beach just three weeks ago. It's still going through its evaluation. The Federal Highway Administration is checking it out and all of the reviews are coming up totally positive in terms of safety, attracting more bicycling, not eating up any more road space, and slowing the motors down. So if we took this section of Main Street as an example and used what we call green sharrows, we use the existing lanes and any time a bicycle is present, the motorist has no right to anticipate the bicycles would ride any faster than bicycle speed. It works very well because it keeps the cyclist away from parked cars and uh, makes parking easier. It uh, slows down traffic naturally, and it's, it's very, very cheap. Uh, projected cost, uh, if we were to pick up the same cost as uh, Long Beach, they did one full mile, both sides of a street, and it came to $10,000. And in engineering dollars, that is like a mere hiccup. It's so tiny. Uh, here you can see it. They did this for 10 blocks, roughly a mile and it helped bring down the speeds. This road is carrying 35,000 cars. And to give you a comparison, Mission is carrying, what about, 25, 26,000. So this is 10,000 cars less than Mission. And it's, it's bringing about an incredible performance uh, in Long Beach. And people now are riding bikes that we never would have seen before. Uh, we certainly wouldn't have seen them in the street. We might have seen them on the sidewalk but even that uh, would have been uh, expecting a lot. And uh, everybody seems to be getting along quite well. And uh, it's a, again, it's a brand new concept. 
So what if we took Main Street, this portion, you can see its existing uh, lane widths and dimensions, 66 feet of right of way. Now, Main Street will vary its curb to curb dimensions as it goes through the corridor. This portion's 40, but we have other areas that are like 36 or 35 feet and so on. So we want a tool that will work the whole length. And so this is what we would do, something like this, if we tried this technique. And so we'd have essentially 14 foot travel lines, two-way street, and uh, then six foot for, for the marked, um, what I like to call the sharrow, goes inside that 14 feet. And then we have the parallel on street parking, then the tree lawn and adjacent property as it exists today. Fairly simple concept. Option two would use bike lanes. Now, with bike lanes, uh, we have to dedicate extra space, so it's going to take down how much space we have left for the travel lane. And note here, that would leave us with uh, nine feet per lane. We would not mark a center line in order to create better sharing. But to do this, we actually have to go into the tree lawn, and whenever you move curbing, you're talking about major costs. So this is a it's an option, but it gets into very, very, very big bucks very quickly compared to the Shero concept. Uh, we could also dip in deeper and be able to get uh, both the Shero lanes in and angled parking parallel on the other if we're wanting to max out the parking. We could go to back in angled. Again, notice the physical width with the bike lanes. And again, if we're going to dip into the uh, planter row, then we could get the bike lanes back in. But again, this is, this is not our cheapest option, but it is an option. Another tool that we can introduce and can be very helpful is the use of curb extensions. You've already been using them uh, in Mount Pleasant. Uh, they have many benefits. They get you further out to view and see traffic. They make it more visible for the pedestrian to step out and have a good place to view and they help slow down traffic and give you many options. They also, uh, using one design, don't have to attach to the curb, so you don't have to interrupt the drainage. Therefore, the costs stay very affordable. And this is becoming a fairly popular way to do curb extensions. And again, notice we are able to get the stop sign out where it's more noticeable. And again, very friendly. We make sure that uh, we're not pushing the cyclist out into the street. Uh, another feature that we can add, if you like, is snow. Well, even if you don't like, we can add snow. And uh, keeping in mind that we have a lot of issues with snow, uh, as, as many of you reported, uh, the snow removal practices aren't uniform. <laughs> some people do, some people don't. And uh, uh, sometimes snow gets plowed to where it buries things, as you see here. Uh, now, there are different approaches that can be used. One is to now allow parking 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and to say, we'll deal with the snow, but we'll deal with it differently than you have to move your car at 2 in the morning every night, <laughs> all year, even though no one's ever seen snow in July. Um, so uh, these are just examples of what other people do. They uh, only eliminate parking when there's been a storm. And then they have the right equipment and they prioritize the removal of snow from sidewalks. And this is something that was asked for in the group as well and it's certainly something that you'll see in my recommendations that if you're going to make Main Street the corridor then you need to give special emphasis to snow removal for people walking just as you would for people driving a car. Lighting. Uh, a major issue that was brought out. And uh, a lighting, uh, many things we're going to talk about, but it can be very expensive. A lamp like this, for example, can come in at four or $5,000 for a single lamp. And uh, so I'm going to show some alternatives. This I found up on a mountain pass in Alaska. Uh, the poles are much cheaper. And you can angle the lamps to cover the sidewalks as well as you could the streets. And again, I'm just wanting to show that there's 
tremendous variation from what we're used to. I also mentioned during the presentation last night that uh, lighting a main street uh, should have three separate elements. The first is the street lamps themselves. They create that uniformity and that quality, but the second can be more important and powerful, and that is to require shop owners to leave their lamps on, or their lights on, in the front windows until, say, 11 at night, using a timer. And notice the warm glow that gets created. The third source of lighting is to accent the buildings themselves. And so we have three different sources of lighting, all of which come up with a, a, a strong command of the desire for people to walk. We can outline buildings, for example, for that third form. We can downlight. We can use a, a whole series of lamps. And as I understand, I haven't seen it, but I understand your Christmas lights are spectacular here. Uh, but this can be year round uh, if, if the goal is to get people to come to Main Street, enjoy Main Street, and enjoy the special beauty of your uh, design. Up lamps that uh, accent. A very, very powerful source of lighting. Then crossings, getting across the street. My recommendation is going to be to get away from your two skimpy lines and to go to high emphasis crosswalk markings everywhere, uh, certainly on Main and uh, the adjacent streets and High Street and other streets of great importance. And this is the reason why. Uh, from a pure physics standpoint, a motorist seeing two parallel lines doesn't get much information at all. You add to that rain and snow and other issues, there's hardly any information that gets transferred to the motorist. The pedestrian can see all the information, thinking the motor sees it, but it just turns out not, not to transfer over. When we do high emphasis markings, we can get them down below the pavement level so that they don't get plowed up. Uh, these, for example, tried out in Boulder, have been lasting uh, as long as 10 years without uh, needing to touch them up. Madison, Wisconsin, a very similar success using high emphasis markings and uh, putting the black bands around them for even more definition. So this is what you have, uh, and I consider it woefully inadequate. You have uh, crossings that are so far back that a motorist who's making, say, a right-hand turn on the far side doesn't even have a chance to see that there's a pedestrian standing there. That's very, very bad design. So what if we redesign this intersection, and that is one of my highest recommendations, that if you're going to have this be a corridor and you're going to attract a lot of people up and down the corridor, then you really need to take your most vulnerable point and make it very benign, right? And so um, notice on this side of the street, the crosswalk was taken out. Now what that requires a pedestrian to do, who say is on this side of the street, is to cross the side, the main street in this case, then high street, and then main street again. You get six exposures per leg of crossing, so that would be 18 conflicts that you have to walk through, as opposed to just going straight across, only having six. So it is not common practice. In fact, it's strongly discouraged in traffic engineering to not put a crosswalk in on all four legs. Very important. Uh, and again, your signals uh, for a one-way operation are facing uh, a wrong way. So this is an expensive thing to shift out your traffic signals. But it needs to be done if you go to a two-way street. And again, notice all the width that you have. You actually have quite a bit of width on high. So this is the intersection seen from a plan view. And these are my recommendations. That you put in median islands on both sides of high and do the same on main. And you do this with Washington as well. So both streets go back to 2A and get a high quality intersection in design. You also, in this case, <clears throat> would add more signals. You'd have pole-mounted signals, which I'll show you in a second. You use countdown timers. That could be replaced as soon as uh, there's available equipment. That's very inexpensive. 
And uh, you use what we call the pedestrian lead interval. Essentially, when the signal comes up, only the pedestrian is permitted to go. Three seconds later, the motorist finally gets their green ball. So the pedestrian is fully in the street, fully seen, before the motor starts to do their right-hand turn. So it's a significant advance over um, conventional engineering. Uh, design the entire length of high street for no higher than 30 miles an hour. When we see someone going 35 or 40 or faster, that's ludicrous for the number of intersections and driveways that line high street. So a number of points over time that would be handled throughout all of high street, but start with these two intersections first because they're so critical to the life of the students and the connectivity that is needed. Countdown signals basically uh, count down, uh, tell you how much longer you have to live. <laughs> you can activate them. Uh, might be real important um, certain periods of the day. The post-mounted signals appear as you see here. They're, they're a very reasonably priced traffic control feature. And you can use what we call uh, mass, but these are not approved for use in the United States. These are used in advanced nations that understand traffic operations and are trying to keep their costs low and spread the wealth. The um, islands themselves uh, create a beautiful little pocket or shadow so that you shift from one conflict direction to when you cross out the next conflict location. So it makes the crossing very simple. Here we see the high emphasis markings. These in Cambridge, definitely snow country. I also like to recommend on the islands themselves that you cap the nose of the islands with your best floral arrangement. These should be very noticeable on the approach and uh, very simple to do. And or in some cases, uh, you can, for example, on the side streets, you can have either mountable or partially mountable noses. But again, notice the importance of the protection of the crossing itself. Now, another thing that could be done on High Street to bring the speeds down is to take the third lane, score out all the asphalt, replace it with concrete, and then use color and pattern to make the entire road look uh, narrower. This is snow country. This is Manitou Springs, Colorado. So it's not as though you're going to do some, something that nobody else has ever done or nobody has ever done in snow country. These are pretty basic tools. They also act as a good passing lane for emergency responders when the car pulls over. Now, I've saved what I like to say the best for last. I want to get into the community character. It's something several of you brought out in the presentation, and I really wanted to, to add in. So at the campus end and the downtown end, you need a strong, compelling feature that draws you. Indeed, if you're standing at the campus, you would see the one downtown. And if you're downtown, you will see the one at the campus. Notice on this one, we lifted the feature so that we can showcase the art that's in the feature. You can use any of a number of uh, methods to uh, use the, the banners. Uh, they are totally customized. You can change them by season. And certainly, uh, a, a fraternity or a sorority house could have their own to mark their block or their area. And uh, you can then go to the industrial arts and come up with features. And again, this is building the character of the corridor, the pride. The, this is a very special place to come to. Good places to sit, fun places to sit. Lamps. And uh, again, other ways to decorate. The upper left is Holland, Michigan, where they have a greenhouse. And anybody can get uh, flowers as long as they are placed at the street. Uh, we need to define the edges. Um, other things that help define character, gateways into each block on the sidewalks for certain. Uh, really fun things, all of which could be planned. There could be an organizing committee for the entire corridor. And again, places to sit, places to converse, fun, authentic, unique. 
colorful. Now, out on a real lark, uh, we came up with the idea of weather shelters. Uh, weather shelters uh, could be just as jovial as you'd want. You don't have to have transit in order to build a weather shelter, uh, but again, they become places of art, places to gather, places for fun, places where you want people to gather as opposed to where you don't want the noise. <laughs> and I think everybody's got that one figured out. Uh, but wouldn't it be fun to have a, a shelter where you could also swing? I don't know, maybe that's just me, okay. Um, how about something that is very tasteful, that makes you hungry for an apple or something? Yeah. Uh, or really far out, this one's in Ventura, California, uh, but it is a transit shelter and uh, is, is quite a statement. Or how about something homey? Uh, just a place to settle in, again, get out of the weather, and uh, just en enjoy taking a pause, uh, attract older people to come and walk the corridor to engage with the younger folks. Uh, one that's even more enclosed uh, and uh, can allow a person to warm up. Or one that's just totally made for fun, uh, as you see here. So. Uh, these are my recommendations. Uh, they are uh, basically those that I came up with that I think are most affordable, can be built with a moderate budget, uh, starting with going back to two-way streets. Uh, that will slow down traffic speeds a lot. The next is to uh, use all the designs that we've been talking about to bring the speeds down to 25 and to make that a consistent speed and then um, after looking at all the alternatives to promote and uh, support walking and bicycling, the green share lane seemed to be the most reasonable to work the entire length of the corridor with no extra taking of space in the street uh, and bringing the speeds down. And uh, many circles, my recommendation is every other block, and then you go over to say Washington and you do every other block, but they'd be alternatives. Now, you wouldn't necessarily build them all at one time. You might start with five and then see how they work and then later go to an added five, uh, uh, some, some number that works. To uh, create the focal points, to fix high street, to me that is paramount, and then to place new street lamps that set the bar height for designing street lamps in affordability and quality and sustainability, all the things we really care about. Uh, and right now, the, the lamps that we buy off the shelves, so to speak, are very, very pricey. So I think there's, there's opportunity for a new industry here. And so we've been putting our thinking caps on, thinking of some of the other ways we can do good quality lamps and meet the lighting needs, but do it without having to spend like three to $5,000 per lamp. Uh, for certain, to create the character corridor, including uh, uh, making the Main Street the walking destination. It's got so many good buildings and so many uh, uh, points of value. And then uh, to consider an art walk. And with all these things together, to get people to take pride in removing their cars from their front lawns and to start to bring back the value and the worth of every individual property so that we can really make it one of the most dignified streets in town. To change the code on parking that's no longer required that every bedroom has to have a parking space. Uh, un until we change the code, there's no way to get people to do anything different than, than what we have. So and along with adding more parking on street to the principal street and to the side streets, and then changing the code, we can have a dramatic shift in how things look. Uh, with that, uh, to uh, have a new practice that you're not to move your car, that once a storm hits, yes, now we have to work with that, uh, but also to put a very high emphasis on removing snow from the sidewalk and to uh, use curb extensions as needed and high emphasis crosswalks everywhere. And then consider one block to model for our angled parking. And uh, that's not going to be cheap. When you add a lot of parking, you have to build a lot of infrastructure and set the drainage. You might get lucky on the drainage, 
But the point is, that can be a future thing that you model and you find the block that wants to be the model uh, where the money gets spent. And with that, uh, again, the idea is not to come in with little ideas that might catch a little bit of favor and positive ideas, but to come in with big, bold ideas that are going to change and make Main Street the, the, the home of choice, the corridor of choice, the prime pipeline between the campus and the downtown, pump new life into retail, and pump more folks into walking on the campus and enjoying the absolutely marvelous things you have going for you here in Mount Pleasant. So, um, comments, thoughts, and let's just pass the baton around because I think this has been videotaped, being sent out over international TV. Is that right? Yeah, do you want to walk around and have people raise their hands? And um, so, thoughts, ideas. Did we get it right? What did we leave out? You know, yeah, I think it's real exciting and uh, inspiring. Uh, my question is, what about broadband wireless? When I first was on the City Commission, we really pushed that. Wouldn't that be a really good feature to, to have on this? And when people are sitting there, they could be on their iPhones or laptops or whatever. Well, and, and also, maybe it could be a collaboration between the CMU and the, and the city, because I know they have fiber and all that. Yeah, I think it would be fabulous. In fact, I've been talking to some city managers around the country that say that when they started to evaluate the cost of broadband wireless for public access, it was so dirt cheap, they said, we're not going to do it in a pocket or a hot spot, we're going to do it throughout the Main Street, because it was so affordable, and it gave them such an edge. There's and there's federal money. I didn't know that. Okay. This in November. Great. Other folks. Um, I wasn't in on the planning session, so um, I didn't hear all that. But I was just wondering, university has a nice ending at the, end, at the south end of town with the commons and everything. But Main Street, you know, where it ends on the south side of town isn't as attractive, although I do agree it's a nice corridor. What was the thinking on making Main Street. The yes, and, um, and that was one of the questions we asked people. D is Main Street the right one to emphasize? Now, that doesn't mean University or Washington or any other street would be overlooked. It just means that as a main corridor where we're going to have a lot more walking, a lot more uh, emphasis, um, that it happens to be the corridor that is nicely aligned, even though it doesn't come right into the heart of the campus. It is still very direct, and it uh, has enough width that we can do things that we can't do on some of the other streets. So that was an important consideration. And if you stop to think about it, it's, it's where we've already invested in high street crossings. So there's a lot of logic that went into that. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. I wonder if you could give a little more explanation of exactly how the Sharo worked. Because to tell you the truth, I didn't quite get how it was going to work. Yes, let me go back to it. Now, the Shero is brand new. Just putting the symbol on the ground without doing anything else is, is been around for five or six or eight or 10 years and has proven very popular. But adding the green is a totally new concept. And what the green does is it distinguishes for the bicyclist where they should be riding so that they don't get too close to the car. It also allows us to take it and a use of, make advantage of a street that is carrying very high volumes of traffic where we just simply don't have any more width so we can't get the bike lanes in. So it's the most economical way that we can make use of existing infrastructure, uh, the total width of the road, and it sends a very clear and direct message to the motorist 
that they are to share that lane when there's a bicyclist present. They can go out and pass, but they cannot honk the horn and expect the cyclist is going to move over for them because they're not. That that's the courtesy. That's the, the way. Now, before the city makes the commitment uh, and spends that kind of money, because this will still be one of the very first in the nation, I am recommending that a small study team go out and study it in Long Beach. Talk to the engineers. Read the Federal Highway Administration uh, uh, results. And we need some volunteers here. Uh, and I think it's going to be on the coldest day of the year when the study tour will go out. February. <laughs> February, yep. Uh, but it is a new tool, and so it's good that you have questions, because uh, until I saw it, I had heard about it for weeks, until I actually got on a bike and rode it up and down three or four times, I said, how can this be any different? It was totally different. It, two questions. One, does, does the paint have to be green? And two, um, is it slippery when, when it's wet for bikers and motorcyclists? Uh, let me answer the second question first because they were having trouble figuring out uh, if it was going to be slippery because it never rained. Five, six, eight weeks went by and it never rained. And uh, so finally it rained and they said, yeah, there's a, 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 a little concern, but they the fellow that I talked to, who is the, the mobility coordinator, who's a very skilled cyclist, he went and he figured every way he could slide and fall, and he couldn't. So we're pretty sure it, it creates no problem. But when they repaint this, which is going to come up pretty soon, just simply because they want to go to the next level, they're going to add granular content into the paint so that it will have a higher coefficient of friction than regular asphalt. So that's a really good question. Uh, what was your first question again? Color. Do they have to be green? Yeah. Uh, if it was my choice, I would say absolutely not. It should be, uh, what's that color that you're Maroon. wearing? Maroon. Yeah, that's the color that I would prefer because it blends in with trees. It, uh, it's the colors of somebody's campus. I don't know whose it is. But, um, but there is what we call the manual and uniform traffic control devices, and their preference is green. It's not my preference. I have red out in front of my own house. Uh, and I like it. It's been on the ground for eight years. Uh, I think red's a better color. It's more natural and this and that. And that may be a, a thing that you could ponder. Gold could be another choice? Yeah. Yeah. The white could be gold. Yeah. Do people, do cars ever get ticketed for, you know, so say there's a rider on the right side of the lane, like in the right picture, and a car cuts close, you know, doesn't give them the whole green arrow, you know, doesn't give them the full six feet. Do you then ticket that person? What do you do? Because I don't see this being any different than now. I see a car going, giving you a foot of space and going on with their life. Right. On the left panel, notice the cyclist is totally taking the center of the lane, which is what we recommend that you, you need to be bold enough that you don't create any confusion for the motorist. And, um, and that is the law, by the way, that the bicyclist has the full use of the lane that they occupy when the lane is too narrow to share. That is the law, and you could get a ticket if you're... It is the law uh, that motorists are not to uh, be too close to a cyclist. And indeed, a few states, not many, but a few states have actually said it's got to be six feet or more. I was just wondering if it took any period of instruction or education. I mean, I'm not seeing that that's going to work overnight because, you know, we're just not familiar with that. So was it a difficult process? I would recommend the education that you, you get out good information to motorists ahead of time and so on, for no other reason than just risk management. However, in their case, they just wanted to do the experiment, and they didn't want to have an active campaign ahead of time. They have had no problems at all that anyone has identified, even though they didn't do any kind of advanced promotion or, or whatever. While the construction's going on, the painting and so on, people are starting to see something's going on here. So they, they were prepared when people called in and said, what are you doing to our street? to answer the questions, but there was no formal education that went in. 
once they finish this evaluation from the Federal Highway Administration, which I think will be over in another three months, they will now go to step two, where they will uh, go to a marketing campaign, try to get more people to come and bike and get off of the sidewalks and do things. So that will come. But right now, they, for testing purposes, they just wanted to put it in and see how it worked without any, anything else. Maybe I missed this because I stepped out for a minute, but it looks like the lanes you have, they're both going on, they're all going on one-way streets. They're going in one direction. Is, is that, I mean, the three pictures you show there, the, the vehicles and the bikes, there's two lanes and they're all going in one direction. Oh, this may show it a little better. It's actually a four-lane road with a median. So you have two lanes in each direction. This would be almost exactly Mission. Uh, now, this isn't an area that has a very good, high-quality urban form. The buildings are built to the street, so it's not like Mission. But it's got exactly the same number of lanes. And in their case, they're running 10,000 more cars than Mission is running. Main Street. Yeah, I'm suggesting we take this, uh, the whole length of Main, and putting in the Green Sharrow lanes, as you see here. The question is, has anyone done this on a two-way street? Well, all the streets has been done on were two-way streets. Side by side, rather, without a boulevard or anything in the center. Was it? Well, there have only been two that have been done in the nation. Uh, the one I'm very experienced with now is Long Beach. The other one is in Salt Lake, which, by the way, is snow country, of course. But I haven't seen that one, so I, I just don't know what the lane configuration is. Yeah. You probably will be first in the nation to do it on a two-lane road versus a multiple-lane road. That's just a guess. I don't know what the Salt Lake experience is. Somebody has to be first. And that is also why I recommend you send a study team out to look at it before you start to make your capital expense. I just want to say I like that idea, but definitely maroon and gold. Definitely, yeah, okay. Dan, I have another question. Do you have any experience or data on how this kind of thing, uh, how, what the outcome is, say, with a college population versus just community residents? Because, you know, we're talking two different ways of thinking here, I think, about a community. Right. So I just wondered if you had any idea of how, say, college students would react to this kind of thing on the south side. Right. Many of you alerted me to how unique your student population is. Uh, the toilet paper in the trees, you know, the, 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 the stuff we see often. Um, all I can really say is uh, I was once a college student. I know how college students think or don't. <laughs> I know that you've got special problems with uh, a, a lot of the things that have gone on on Main Street, parties and noise and things that upset the neighborhood. I personally feel that the more you do to create a sense of pride and ownership and commitment by each uh, group of students who live there, as well as all those who travel through there, they're going to treat this street as though it was a very special place to them. Uh, we know that from other projects we've worked on that we can go into the, the most rundown ghetto in America and get the children to create the art and then nobody will apply graffiti. And we know that with almost anything we do. My assumption is college students will, will respond very similarly that if, if they see this as a source of their block, their pride, that they're going to treat everything on that street differently than they might have if it was just something that was in their way. <laughs> That's just a feeling I have. Yeah. No data. Uh, actually, there's a precedent for sending folks to California to check out the development there. 
Uh, years ago when I was on the city commission, I was sent to Arcata, California, which I really liked. I was there for quite a while, and there was a lot of innovation and creativity. And one, the city didn't want to do it, but that's another story. Uh, but one of the things that I really liked when I was there was they had a, a North Country Fair event, and they have a town square there. And what happened is every woman of the, and it could be whoever, but every woman of the city designed their own outfit, and they had a samba parade around the square. I'm say, suggesting that we have some kind of event like that on this corridor every year, a specific, special city celebration with costumes, dancing, music. They also had like people selling salmon. They had bands on every corner, you know, stuff like that. That's what, stuff I like. Very good recommendation. In fact, those of you who haven't been to Arcata, it's a very, very good city. Um, and I love that square. You can uh, dial in and watch the square anytime you want. They've got a video camcorder on the square all the time. And it really is a happening place. Oh, totally. Totally. I had a question about the on-street, on, on the parking, mm -hmm. on um, the rec combined recommendation of you don't necessarily have to have a parking place for each person in a rooming house, for example, right. uh, that, if you allow the on-street parking. But then also um, that you do the snow alerts. So you're using the on-street parking as your permanent parking place, but then you're not going to be able to park there during snow alerts, which we have quite a few of. So my question is, where do those cars go then? Since they don't have a permanent place other than the place on the street and they can't park there when there's snow, uh, what tends to happen um, in places where right. they have this? Um, there are many, many cities that have overcome the snow by coming to some policies and practices where, and I believe this is correct, in, um, Cambridge, Manchester by the Sea, many of the, the East Coast cities that have very high parking needs, I mean totally dense, totally saturated. There is no ban on parking at all. The snow comes, the plows come, and then people have to individually carve out their car. <laughs> now, you may get a mix. You may get people who, who say, I don't want to do that again, so they find another place where they can park their car during that blizzard that they know is going to be a big blizzard and the snow is going to be pushed into and cover the windows of their car. I think it's all just common sense. I think we've overdone our concern with snow and that those cities that are very concerned that people have good parking spaces, that there is no such thing as an off-street parking space in Cambridge and everybody parks on the street, they've learned to deal with it. Um, now, you could pay a lot of money and find an off-street parking space in Cambridge, but there aren't many people that have that kind of wealth. Uh, I think the point, though, is that uh, the whole time I've been working in Michigan, over 14 years now, um, Michigan just has this, this thing about not parking on streets and coming up with any excuse not to park on a street. 365 days a year. And I think it is going to be time to reverse that decision and still keep all your elected officials elected. Um, it's, 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 just, it's just something you have to overcome. You live in snow country. Enjoy it, appreciate it, but understand that you cannot have front lawns full of parked cars if you want to have a respectful place for people to walk and take pride in their buildings and things like that. So you're going to have to become a model, maybe for the whole state that you can have parking, you can have snow, and you can have beautiful lawns all at the same time. Now, uh, I didn't show, but you can load up your side streets with a lot more parking as well. So there are a lot of places. And there is good space that you could work in off of the alleys and, and so on. So there are many, many choices, but you probably will want to uh, put together a parking management strategy for all of Main Street, figure out how many more spaces you're going to get on Main Street, how many on the side streets, how many would then still be left as uh, uh, off-street parking uh, that the developer and the landlord uh, maintain? Yes, sir. 
When I was in Kalamazoo, they had overnight even and overnight odd parking, so that if it was an even day of the week, you parked on the even numbered side, and the odd, you parked on the odd, which still facilitated snow removal. They'd go through and blast it all out on one side, and then come back the next night and get the other side of the street. Yeah, there's so many different ways to do it. And, and again, uh,